welcome to everyone to a very special gathering, the first of its kind. We're gathering today for a very special purpose. We're gathering with a lot of intention to grow new narratives in a new world, but also remembering where we're coming from. There's been many conversations that have led to this, and there'll be many conversations that lead from it. So it's today is today, but it's part of a longer conversation. We're going to hear from B just really what's underneath uh, the, the quest and the invitation for being here. B, this is your time, and we're really listening. We're really, really listening to this architecture that comes from not just the last seven years, but from your whole life, from your grandma, from your roots, from your tradition, from your world work. So we're, we're really, really listening. <laughs> well, it's very special to be here today and how it came together um, and that we're here with seven people on the 7th of December, this company being seven years old. Um, and it, I want to give a little bit of a background on how it grew. I started to feel after seven years like I know from where I talk. Um, I, I hold a lot of different stories. I hold a lot of... Um, things in my head and I thought we need to expose the architecture from which I talk, architecture or value system or whatever, because now it's not just me anymore, it became an us. We might find that other people have a similar architecture, um, and, but to expose that so we can more purposely tap into what we do and, or, or how we do things from where we do things. Often. People look at the Alinker and it's about the Alinker and they start asking things about what and how, what, why did you make that? And the Alinker is the Alinker because I work from my reverse design practices. And so today is a sort of reverse design of that. Like we don't focus on the Alinker, but we focus on the architecture where it came from and the architecture what drives the Alinker company to be what it is and who it wants to be in the world. My grandma is a pretty crucial person in my life. She was an extremely poor woman from a very poor family line. And she had a few of those wisdoms that somehow totally stuck with me. And one of them is she said, one and one is two. And everybody who tries to tell you that that's different somehow makes money over it. <laughs> so when I look at systems, it's a seat in the ground, you add water and it grows. Anything that's more complicated, somebody makes money. And it shouldn't be more complicated than that. Like, I'm in connection with those people here, and we have something good together. It's not more complicated than that. And now we can work together. She also said, and I think it was a lesson in empathy, she said, whenever you face a problem, let's say this is a problem, then go to the other side, turn it around, literally, and look at it again, it's like, oh, that's a completely different perspective. And maybe it turns out it's not a problem anymore because I can see where it comes from. And maybe what I first thought was the problem is actually the system, the symptom of a system that is um, creating those things. But by identifying them as problems, um, we are stuck with fixing problems. So the word problem and solution becomes flag points in reverse design. Like my father, I'm a designer. That's how I look at the world, that's who I am. Now the word design comes from purpose, plan and intention. A design is in fact a process toward a solution with a particular purpose within a context of constraints. In my mind, I've got this four-dimensional sphere that is the, the, the overall purpose of what we're doing. We have tasks to do if you do a project. We need to do this, we need to do that. So that's the width. And then you've got all the resources available to do all those things. And then there's a timeline in which you need to do those things and they intersect with each other. But if you don't check why you're using this, or whether you should be using this resource, or why you're doing this task, and why it is in that timeline. It could be that you're, like we talked about yesterday, doer and manifester, and the difference, 
that you become just a doer. I can't just do things without um, a purpose that I'm, that I'm living in, that I'm working in. As a little example, when I built schools in Afghanistan, highly politicized, American money was not very welcome. I had American money, men need jobs. So use the money to build up the local community, not use the international contractors. If the essence of the project is to get local men employed, to get the local schools built so that their children can go to school, then the intersection of what we need to do and the resources that we have available against the four-dimensional sphere is a discrepancy because an international contractor from America, which was proposed to me, becomes a discrepancy with what we want to do. So that resource is not available to us in this sphere. So it makes you aware of what we can do or should not do because it's tested against the overall purpose and the spirit in which we want to do this project. And the better you put that four-dimensional sphere there, the less you have to manage. Because if people get it, what we're here to do together, and that is really sort of agreeing and being in a value system, exactly what we're doing now, being in a sort of agreed value system and that has purpose, then we don't need to map out the how and the what. Because the how and the what is where people often get lost. We have a society that expects us to be a certain way and be conditioned with the language, with the advertisements that we're seeing. We're constantly living in a world where we're not congruent with what we actually understand deep down inside. And then we need alcohol, we need drugs, we need to... because we actually do not live in congruency with ourselves. A very aware flag for me is like people that want to change the world. Um, why do we need to change the world? Something that you hear often in this time, like everything is broken. No, people are broken in those systems. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff wrong in the world. People get crumbled, people get isolated, people get abused, people get killed. That's not stuff that we can solve. Because the systems do really well on war, on pharmacy, on food industry. We don't change that. The only thing that we can change is do something else together that becomes so attractive that the old systems automatically will lose control and will lose power because people will flock to the new world, essentially being together, being in connection, because ultimately we resonate with that. Instead of seeing it as a problem that needs to be fixed outside myself, I become aware of that I'm part of something that is bad for other people, so I need to change my ways. And so everything comes back to, who am I? Do I want to be aware? Am I willing to change my ways to be a kinder person in the world? There is a very binary way of looking at things in this world. We have specialists and we have generalists. What do you want to be when you're later, when you, when you grow up, as if there's only one thing that you can be? Because that is what we're trained to do. Anything, if you're not a specialist, you're marginalized as a generalist. Oh, you just know a little bit of everything. But that's marginalized, so you don't want to be in that field. I have learned over time, knowing who I am, um, that I'm a multi-specialist. And that's new language that we need to create because it doesn't exist in the binary system. From a very young age, I was aware that I was different. And so I had to reinvent myself, like who am I in this world? Looking back at 10 years international work, putting myself as a white person in Kenya, putting myself as a, as a person in Afghanistan, doing schools construction in a society in which we have all those assumptions. Looking back, I think I took control of my life as a weirdo in that international work because now I was in charge. I put myself in that position. As were in my own community when I was a weirdo, I never saw it coming. And I was like, why, why am I not fitting here? So my own culture was like, Whoosh! Now, I was lucky because the conditioning that was happening around me did not rub off on me because it didn't apply to me. I wasn't this typical girl. I wasn't this typical boy. And I'm deeply grateful for that I was aware of being a weirdo 
and having to create conditions for myself in, in who I want to be. And I felt my soul come home in Afghanistan because they don't judge, they go on who you choose to be. A kind person, we can do anything together, it doesn't matter how you look. Because there is no differences. We are people that have chosen to be kind people. And then everything is possible, everything opens up. And I'm sitting from a lens from all those experiences that I'm constantly drawing from. In Afghanistan I learned this. As a therapeutic horseback instructor I learned this. Being with people in very different situations has taught me to be this person and enabled me to make the Alinkar. My father died when I was eight, and everybody disappeared around us. And I realized as, a, as an eight-year-old that people are uncomfortable talking about death. And that's why they disappeared. How come people are clinged onto comfort? What is that? So I was curious as a kid, like, why do people disappear instead of showing up for a young family? So I learned very young in life that people choose their own comfort over showing up for you which to me is a completely weird thing. The presence of death in our life gives life purpose. The willingness to show up for the whole thing. There's things dying, but they're regenerated into life. And to be willing to be part of that circle, yes, things need to die, and it's not always easy. Grieving needs to happen, but grieving is different than suffering from something that I cannot address. Somebody is dying, now they're suffering, because I can't be present to the grief. I'm part of that living and dying system as well. There's also something in our white supremacist, Western, capitalistic world that we have created the right to comfort and in everything that I see in the street and every conversation that we're having it pops up everywhere the right to comfort like how dare you make me feel uncomfortable how dare you confront me with stuff with my disability for example that makes you uncomfortable because we're not willing to be mortal creatures because there's comfort and there's a right to comfort people don't want to change People are attached to what they know. And we're attached to what we know, so we want to change the world instead of ourselves. So changing the world's like, no, change you. And then there was the question of Tanya saying, like, how do we get people to understand what we're doing? But if you reverse design that, why do people need to understand what you're doing? If you go and do in purpose, what you're doing and you're congruent in your actions and your behavior with what you're doing, you become so attractive that people come flocking at you. You don't need to explain anything. You don't need to go out there and try to convince people. The reverse design is like be anchored in who you are in your actions, supporting who you chose to be. Congruency to me is the essential word. Can I give you a hug? Because I just feel like... Yes! Please! <laughs>